So this is an old museum, Greg, and it sits in one of the older parts of town, in particular, a really old park. You talked about this. Mm-hmm. Um, it was Two like the, episodes. I think I thought, it was uh, the amusement park. Amusement one. parks. And, and then uh, baseball. But, uh, yeah, I think it was baseball. No, baseball, we brought up shoots. Park. Wasn't Shoots Park like a water park? No. It had a water slide. Agricultural Park came up twice. Yeah, because I remember the second time you were doing it, I'm like, why is he talking about this again? Yeah. And now here I am talking about it the third time. Yeah. <laughs> so as we've talked about before, twice maybe, it was Agricultural Park. You ever heard this? Uh, never. <laughs> I don't do research. You know that. So by the late 1800, Agricultural Park was a, a filthy den of sin. It was just gambling, drinking, prostitution, worst of all, horse races. Get out! Did they also have dog races and rabbit races? Did they? I think they had dog races where they had to chase rabbits or something like that it was pretty bloody and then they had lions chasing horses this is also the park where they would get two trains and make them crash and then That's all the right. people would go and pick up yeah. the shards of the the wrecked trains but if you didn't solve the math equation quick enough <laughs> the two trains would crash it was completely undignified for a city so offended by horse racing jockeys yeah. so one guy came along named william bowen who is a christian school teacher on sundays and yeah. a prude every day of the week <laughs> and he hated what was going on in agricultural park so he started a movement in the late 1890s to get this place cleaned up and transform it into the complete opposite of what it was like he la was seen as wild and uncultured by people back on the east coast back then and also today so bowen wanted to change that image and make this park into an area where he could exhibit the city's burgeoning culture and class a sort of exposition park he wanted if you will so So to put things on exposition is what you're saying he wanted to exhibit things in an expo (laughs) setting expository way (laughs) so in december 1910 it was finally cleared out and renamed Exposition Park. But now for that culture he was promising, there would be a few cultural institutions, but the centerpiece of it was going to be a museum. In fact, it was going to be the first dedicated museum building in Los Angeles. And with this park being a new haven for science and culture, this museum would be devoted to history, science, and art, and it would be called the Los Angeles County Museum of History, Science, and Art. We'll come up with a better name later. What year was this? Like uh, 60 years. Uh, This was 1910. There were like, you know, exhibits and stuff but there was no building in the city dedicated to being a museum trust me what are you thinking of mine that i did research on that also claimed to be the first museum in southern california or in los angeles but was it a dedicated building or was it just a bunch of building didn't come till 1914 but they established (laughs) themselves as a museum but it was all all exhibits i believe i did say uh (laughs) first dedicated museum building in los angeles fine it's just weird that i did research that also claims that i'm clearly right but go ahead yeah you're clearly right yours that started in 1914 the building happened in 1914 they were ready to go before then no building my god the building opened in 1910 greg gave me a thumbs up (laughs) he he is conceded to certainly didn't are you sitting upside down (laughs) did you get smacked upside the head or something (laughs) so this was the intention but it still had to get negotiated not only with the city but also the county so the first proposals came in oh look even earlier 1905 to try to get the city to agree to give a hundred thousand dollars and for the county to donate $150,000. I'm getting sweaty just talking about these. (laughs) Later, they upped it to $250,000. So what's the big deal? Just give us the money. It's not that hard. It took them five years to agree to do this. And in the end, it was decided that the county itself would be in charge of the museum and the city would be in charge of the grounds. That's weird. It's just kind of like a joint custody thing. Right. Everything that happens We shall split it in half. Yeah. Yeah. The birds and the gems shall be owned (laughs) by the county. In 1910, the museum was a go. And on December 17th of that year, the cornerstone was laid for it on the western axis of what used to be Agricultural Park, which was now Exposition Park, which is now just a big, long rose garden. Which, the rose garden, I I never have walked through the rose garden. Oh, you haven't? No, because it always, I look and I'm like, oh, it's just people sleeping on benches and stuff. People sleeping on benches, people making out in the gazebos. It's still really nice. I don't know what it is about, it made me think of, is this where George Lucas came up with a look for Naboo? Because it looks like <laughs> Naboo. It does look like Naboo, doesn't yeah, it? it? With does. the Gungan sleeping on the benches. And he went to USC, which is right there yeah and there's also a giant george lucas museum being opened up right next to it subtitle of the museum (laughs) the naboo experience (laughs) (laughs) Mm, i I, I don't know it can't be confirmed here as the la meekly promise we can't confirm anything (laughs) (laughs) we refuse to confirm anything but now for the building itself okay it was designed by frank hudson and william ad munsell which is appropriate for history from the bc that he was building a museum for who were the guys who also did the old hall of records in the la county general hospital oh wow okay the original building which 
which is still part of the structure today. It's it's the part that's touching the rose garden, that rotunda, and then the three wings branching off of it. That's the original museum. Okay. So there was three wings, one wing for each of the three things it promised, history, science, and art. Okay. So it was a crazy mishmash of styles, the design of it combining Spanish Renaissance, Romanesque, and Beaux-Arts, but it works. Like it, that front entrance looks real, well, it's not really the front entry. What was the front what entrance? What was the front entrance to the rose garden, yeah. It looks really nice. And when you walked in the rotunda, it was 75 feet wide, had walls of Italian marble, mosaic floors, and the centerpiece of it, the statue, the Three Muses by Julia Bracken went. So the dome of it is 58 feet high with a 20 foot stained glass skylight designed by Walter Horace Judson of Judson Studios in Highland Park, which is still around. Okay. Ever heard of him? No. Oh, that explains why you weren't jumping for joy when I told you that. There, I've Did heard you of- say Jetsons? <laughs> it was designed by George Jetson. <laughs> it's George Jetsons? <laughs> I've heard of them. I've wanted to try to do a field trip episode with them. They're, they're a stained glass studio in Highland Park. That's how around. I know them. Yeah, they've been around forever. Okay, I and was going to ask you for a stained glass and I was yeah, not yeah. sure if I should. What, the stained glass skylight didn't give away that it was a... <laughs> no, not really. I heard skylight in here, stained glass. I like the skylight. Uh, what right. is he talking about? Yeah. Since they were going for prestige and class, this place, it hit the nail on the head with this rotunda. It was just really elegant and yeah. it still is. It's up there with the great impressive museum entryways in the whole country. Uh, so much so that it was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 1975 and was also the place where Tobey Maguire got bit by a radioactive spider in real life. <laughs> It inspired the comic series Spider-Man. It inspired the meme where everyone points at each other. Um, the adventures of the boy who was bitten by a spider. <laughs> the adventures of pointy person in red <laughs> times three. The worst Spider-Man ever. Uh, okay, Greg. There's no need to get nasty. <laughs> that's I Toby Maguire's I job. I believe you're thinking of Andrew Garfield. <laughs> but yeah, that's where they filmed that scene in the original. That's cool. Spider- I think that's cool. And I know you're being sarcastic, but <laughs> I think that's cool. I think it's cool that they filmed the movie there. I think that's I cool. Should, that I movie. should clarify. I think it's cool that they still make movies. <laughs> so this was the museum, but they needed someone in charge to give it direction and to fill it with a bunch of old junk. So the man they chose was the perfect dork for the job. Frank Slater Daggett. Oh my. What a cool guy name. Frank Slater Daggett. It kind of peters off at the last name though. Frank is a, a strong name. Slater is a cool name. Daggett. I think Daggett's a cool name. A it close. implies that you have a dagger. There's an <laughs> no, implication there that you, you are armed. You're the one getting stabbed by the dagger. You're the <laughs> Daggett. It's a little too close to like Dagwood and Dilbert for me okay. to be cool. I know so you don't th- think the names are cool? <laughs> you're telling me you don't think Dilbert is cool? <laughs> um, you don't think Dilbert's a tough name? Yeah, I don't think D names are cool, clearly. This Dirty guy- Harry's last name was Dilbert. Dirty Harry Dilbert. Yeah, Dirty Harry Dilbert. This guy was born in Norwalk, Ohio on okay. January 30th, 1855, which was before the Civil War. Oh my God. If such a time even existed. I, dinosaurs roamed the earth. That's why the Civil War started. <laughs> the South didn't want to acknowledge that dinosaurs existed. I'm not sure what he did for the first 30 years of his life or what side of that war he was on as a six-year-old boy. <laughs> but between the years of 1885 and 1894, he was working as a grain merchant in Duluth, Minnesota, cool. who was also an amateur photographer, and he owned the first ever camera in Duluth, Minnesota. You're kidding. <laughs> well, that's like when you're born before the Civil War, you can do that sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, she owned the one of the six by bicycles in the country yeah, yeah I guess she was the sense. first person in kentucky to wear stockings <laughs> like uh, so many people have these weird titles yeah but more important than that he was also an avid collector of things ever since he was a kid hoarding he, yeah he, he like old newspapers <laughs> and <laughs> takeout containers he can't get rid of ever since he was a kid on some side of the civil war hmm. uh, he loved collecting butterflies and as they always warn you that was just a gateway to collecting other bugs yeah and that led to collecting birds and that carried into his adulthood in Duluth where he would take summer vacations up north into Canada to collect specimens to collect Spiderman to collect Spidermans he would go up north to collect sp- uh, now you got Spiderman in my head <laughs> <laughs> you got Spiderman in your own head I didn't write him in there I think we have one man to blame for this <laughs> he would go up to Canada with indigenous guides and they would guide him around and he'd collect a bunch of bugs and yeah. stuff so it sounds fun and innocent but the reality is that he was going around killing thousands of bugs and birds and mounting them in a collection and he even perfected a new way to preserve bird skin Oh my God. so that it would last longer and look more lifelike than leading methods and also design new types of cases that were better for preserving dead bugs. Is this the grandpa from Texas Chainsaw Massacre? Because it might be. They made a movie about him. It was called Psycho. It's called Pisco. The Pisco Kid. <laughs> Here it is. This part-time Norman Bates eventually grew a collection of over 8,000 dead birds oh my God. and over 2,000 dead beetles. 
animals that he himself killed, preserved, and mounted. He kept them all in a small kitchen. He kept them all in a swamp behind his motel. <laughs> then in 1894, he and his 10,000-strong army of dead things moved to Pasadena, California, where he got deeply involved in the dead bird culture that was there. He s- even started a local bird club with other enthusiasts and began a new collection of Southern California birds and got involved in the American Ornithologists Union. But in 1904, the world of grains called him back and he moved to Chicago to be on the board of trade. But his H.H. H. Holmes obsession with trapping and killing <laughs> birds followed him there too. And also tricking them. He, Part of the game was tricking the birds into staying the stay. night. It's cold out. You need a place to stay in my bug hotel? This birdhouse looks a little bit like an incinerator. No, 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 no. No, it's not. No, that's for humans. I, <laughs> I just collect bugs. That's for human hands. In Chicago, he was once arrested for shooting birds. Oh my god. In Chicago. But Dude, let it go. He can't. <laughs> Serial bird killers can't. This is crazy. He was put on $20 bail for this and nobody expected him to show up for his court date for such a small thing for $20. But Daggett was a fastidious man. To give you an idea, he once wrote an essay called The Importance of Accuracy in Lists. This is the kind of bird-killing business Yeah, all business. So not only did Daggett show up to this court date for $20, he also uncovered that the cop who had arrested him was crooked and was running a blind pig, which is what they called speakeasies, and Uh he ended up getting the officer thrown in jail instead and he got got his $20 back. He came in with an Uno card like reverse reverse draw four <laughs> and the cop was like oh no i thought we were playing solitaire <laughs> he got his money back and got the guy who arrested him thrown in jail <laughs> This is who we're dealing with. By all means, he should be a more well-known name in the natural history world, but the reason he isn't is because he never published any of his scientific works or findings. So he's He didn't much... publish the accuracy of lists? Oh, it was published. Nobody read it. Nah. <laughs> so it wasn't written in list form, so it was kind of hard to read. Yeah, today it would have gone over great. Oh, it would He would have been a big hit on BuzzFeed. Yeah, 51 reasons why your list should be accurate on BuzzFeed. I would have read that. <laughs> bullet point by bullet point. 10,000 reasons I have a bunch of birds in my <laughs> So he's pretty much been forgotten by time. The way he has been immortalized though is that he has had several birds and bugs named after him. There's don't the, kill me. Please don't kill me. The beg for your life. <laughs> There's the Batiogallus dagetti or Daggett's eagle, which is an extinct dinosaur eagle. Morphnus dagetti, which is another extinct eagle. Felis dagetti, which is an extinct puma. Spherapicus various dagetti, which is a red-breasted sap sucker that's still around. And also the Acmeodera dagetti, which is some gross beetle. So uh, all these things were named after him. It's weird. I wonder how they got extinct. Ding. I can't put my finger on it. If there was a list, I could probably figure it out. But There's also about 10,000 other ones that were named <laughs> after him that are no longer around. I think that this memorial for him would have meant more to him than any statue in the Smithsonian or probably. something like that. He would have, If only we could have preserved his body <laughs> and put it on display. You'd be so happy to see this. He'd be this. so happy he'd be jumping for birds right now. <laughs> he'd be jumping on bugs. <laughs> he's jumping for birds landing on bugs right now. <laughs> it's 1910 and back in LA, they're preparing for the city's new Museum of Natural History and they need somebody to run it. And one yeah. of the clubs that Daggett had been in in town had morphed into the southern division of the Cooper Ornithological Club who had a big say in who should be running the new museum so of course they recommended Daggett because right. not only was he an obsessive collector and enthusiast of natural history he was also good at business so he was literally the perfect person for this job so in 1911 he got the job as the first director of the museum and moved back to LA but what he had when he got to the museum was no staff no collection for a museum that was already being built <laughs> he had you know foundation pillars yeah. and oh, him my. so finding people to work there was the easy part but by the time they opened there were only five people running the entire museum okay you're a mason but you're also the board (laughs) board of directors you have to hire the construction crew (laughs) can you do construction but also clean bones without breaking them (laughs) today you have to give a lecture to the visiting president from brazil about our bug collection but then when you're done you have to clean all the toilets because (laughs) there's literally no one else to do it the hard part was growing a collection out of nothing and being a new museum in los angeles which was a newish city they had a lot going against them. Most importantly, most of the good art and artifacts were already in all the established museums on yeah. the East Coast, and also they had very little money to do anything. They also had no reputation. Well, we, what we had a lot of was birds. <laughs> Put some thumbtacks in the birds' wings. Yeah. There's a museum. <laughs> we got ourselves a museum. <laughs> so people were reluctant to donate or even loan any of their stuff, yeah. like private collectors, to the museum. They were even having to assure people that the building was secure from theft and fireproof to try to convince people. Like, 
Like that's how little they trusted them. Like I'm not going to give my stuff to the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles. Someone's going to break in at night. Everything in this city burns. Not here. What's going to burn of yours that's around a bunch of flammable old dry birds and bugs? It's going to be fine. But slowly the donations started coming in. The heroes here were the Historical Society of Southern California, the Cooper Ornithological Club that Daggett was a part of, the Southern California Academy of Sciences, and the Fine Arts League who gave a lot of their own stuff to get the museum going. The historical collection was 100% donated and loaned from the Historical Society and also the Native Sons and Daughters of the Golden State who gave a bunch of pioneer and native artifacts. Like, like, How did they get it? Look, it's like, you know, it's a blood diamond if you buy a brand new blood diamond, but <laughs> if it's a blood diamond passed down generations to you, then there's no uh, controversy. Uh, uh, guilt only lasts for two generations. Yeah. So does the power to convict. <laughs> they got like pottery, utensils, and photos, and branding irons, which focus mostly on early California life. But they also got a loan of ink and pottery from the Museum of Lima and a bunch of traditional knives from the Philippines. But then donations started coming in from individual collections like the Charles J. Prudhomme collection of pictures from the early days of Los Angeles and portraits of people who lived here in that time. So Prudhomme was a member of the Historical Society and his dad, his dad, not dad, his dad, it also, his dad also fought in the Bear Flag Revolt. Oh, okay. Wow. So he's like, claiming the state for the union. Look at that as you look will. Look at that. But there were also donations that came in from local amateur explorers and adventurers, which is something I'd love to be like. That's what I love hearing of like, oh, this guy went on a trip to Egypt and he, he stole all these things from the Egyptian <laughs> from people. the indigenous tribes there. <laughs> yeah, the he indigenous had to, uh, tribes of Egypt. I don't know why I saw uh, what tribe is at the beginning of uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark because whenever you're talking about pillaging uh, ancient artifacts, that's the first thing I see. Well, it also does go to Egypt. The original tribe in Egypt was the Nazis, wasn't it? <laughs> Going by your knowledge. The Nazi party. <laughs> the Nazi tribe of Egypt. <laughs> so in this way, they managed to get their hands on a very extensive and complete coin collection. Uh, an old style bomb is about to drop on an Acme brand bomb is about to drop on us. Well, right lucky now. for us, it's not going to go off. If I know anything, <laughs> until about we get it. we get close to it and kick it. Yeah, until we try playing Swanee River on it and then yeah. it'll explode. They got a this complete coin collection. They got baby dresses from early LA settlers. That was from the pervert collection of <laughs> copper from the old missions and artifacts from ancient Egypt. Where the Nazis? Where the Nazis? The were Nazi born tribe lived yeah. for thousands of years. Thousands and thousands of years. For the art department, like I said, they relied heavily on the Fine Arts League, but they also got a few loans from East Coast museums willing to throw us a bone and also private collections like Ethel Conover from New Orleans who loaned a Raphael painting called The Violinist that had been in her family for 250 years oh and was worth $350,000 and they sold it. We could split the profits with you because we already sold it. <laughs> there was also a painting of William Mulholland loaned by the man himself oh, wow. and a collection of weapons donated by none other than Harrison Gray Otis, of course. Of course. Here, the cops are looking for me. Can you just pin this to the wall or something? Yeah, but, uh, he, he put my on it. He didn't so much donate it as drove by and threw it out the back <laughs> of his car one day. He didn't donate it as much as he put it in a trash bag and asked us to just uh, Burn hold this. it till hold it till the heat dies down. Wait until I get out of Sing Sing, <laughs> and then I want it back. And he never got out of Sing Sing. They also got the Hinman collection of fine china, which was considered to be one of the best collections in the country, and also a collection of Chinese porcelain from A. Burlingham Johnson, which was also considered to be one of the best of those in the country. I think Hinman of the fine china had something to do with the building where Grand Central market is i think he might have owned it or had it it does built. sound familiar i, wrote I think we're thinking about hinkley once. again i might be thinking of john hinkley god i always do that he had such fine china no one ever talks about that yeah he He's had really good china and he wrote jody foster and all of it i don't know what that was about either i don't really know a lot about history i'm kind of learning as i go i learned a lot from <laughs> vh1 i learned a lot from trl <laughs> then of course there was the science department and that meant animals and bones which was daggett's specialty oh yeah, yeah yeah he donated his massive collection of dead birds and bugs and then came other there's like the Yates collection, which had almost 2,000 different types of seashells that were collected largely around Catalina Island. Then there was a donation from Baron Rothschild that helped build up a collection of 11,000 mounted butterflies and moths. Wow. Then they actually sent people out to places like Africa and South America to hunt and kill big game <laughs> to stuff and put on display, which is problematic. Yeah. But wasn't it worth it to have the last white rhino on display filled with straw in the Natural oh, History Museum? All kids from like Pasadena going to see a white rhino. Yeah. Who cares about those? 
those kids in whatever country yeah. in white rhino land the kids in pasadena have to see they need it. to see bones but then of course came the dinosaurs tell me about the dinosaurs daniel well you see before the civil war <laughs> at first they got a donation of locally found fossils from the southern california academy of sciences but in 1913 daggett negotiated with george allen hancock for the exclusive rights to excavate and keep prehistoric remains from the tar pit on his ranch for two years wow what we now call the la brea tar pit so they got he got the natural history museum exclusive rights whatever you find for two years is all yours wow. and in those two years they took out a million fossils mostly from the pleistocene era from things like saber-toothed tigers giant sloths wolves camels for some reason <laughs> and all of these were sorted in the basement in a room they called of course the bone room <laughs> that's so funny the bone room <laughs> they also found the oldest tree ever discovered really in the la brea tar pit oh my god it was a 200 thousand year old cypress making it the oldest piece of wood in existence it's so funny that like this is nothing interesting happening in la other than we found some of the oldest yeah. human remains here and the oldest tree is nothing in existence whatever is... happened around the los angeles area except for those one million dinosaur bones <laughs> that they found yeah they, it was the oldest piece of wood in existence and guess what they lost it <laughs> guess what it's part of milton Burrow. go ahead they're still pulling it out <laughs> they found it it had two people's initials carved <laughs> into it cro magnon loves neanderthal but their biggest literally find came when they unearthed the fossil of an imperial elephant which shocked me before i realized that's just what they call woolly mammoths oh, yeah, which yeah. is also shocking they found a full woolly mammoth Damn. this was the only mammoth ever uncovered from the pleistocene era at that time it was 18 feet long 15 feet tall Jeez. with 15 foot long tusks but they never found that volcano that's under there i know it's i know it's there keep digging could we get like a few more years on the lease and since this mammoth was so mammoth and the museum was so poor how poor was it daggett had to beg the board of supervisors to give them an extra 19 dollars to buy wheelbarrows to transport it to the museum oh my god no carry it you got five people on staff carry it (laughs) oh it's just a mammoth it's not an elephant you can carry it lift with your legs well lift with your leg bones that you also dug up there use those as wheelbarrows (laughs) Daggett his back with your legs go ahead (laughs) daggett also had the foresight to keep this incredibly unique and entirely local collection of fossils intact and not like trade it off to other museums for other things because he wanted to keep it available to be studied which is something that'll come up later so he wasn't like wheeling and dealing like i'll trade you a saber tooth tooth oh, saber tooth tooth for yeah. could we get a velociraptor maybe <laughs> so this was the collection they scrounged up to start out with 175 of the collections were donated 35 were loaned and they crammed them all into 70 cases on display that took six months to set up leading to their first grand opening on july 4th 1913 still before your southwest museum no 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 that's not true no i know i said 1914 but it was a weird Uh-oh. it was a leap year a leap ahead <laughs> for this first grand opening about 10,000 people showed up but only the science and history halls were open to the public but a second more formal grand public dedication came on november 6th of that year the second grand opening was part of a two-day huge citywide coming out party of sorts the day before this was when the aqueduct was dedicated oh wow and this day was kind of on the 6th the museum was kind of rededicated to the city as a place of culture and the two events were linked by the fountain in the middle of the rose garden spewing out precious owens valley water a big week in la they were kind of like we have water now <laughs> we're just as cultured as, yeah uh, we're officially a city yeah. now we we took our first bath this morning can we come over philadelphia no yeah so it was it was a big to do we took a step into the world-class city game on that yeah. day this time another ten thousand people came to the big gala inside the museum and many more were turned away with all the wings open and people were just blown away by it the art and history were fine but people lost their minds over the animals and fossil collection because remember that at that time most people had barely even seen a picture of like a lion or something like that and now there was a barely alive a year ago one stuffed recreated in its habitat right in front of them and nobody knew what a dinosaur looked like so seeing the actual bones of a mammoth or a giant sloth was unbelievable but it was all real because it was a museum so no one had seen anything like this in the city so this was how it all started and from there they just built upon that collection and upon the building itself they started putting on programs that became hits with the public. In 1914, they put on the first gold medal exhibition presented by the California Art Club that highlighted California artists and has been going on every year since then Mm -hmm. for over 100 years. They did a whole exhibit on the book Ramona that was really popular. The California Art Club also eventually had contests here every year for amateurs where the winner would win $100 credit to the pig and whistle. Oh, that's pretty cool. I take that. I mean, $100 credit, I could 
buy the pig and whistle <laughs> pig and whistle for a hundred dollars back then that could be our uh, one drink minimum or a one item to yeah. get on the open mic now you can yeah, now you can afford to go in with a hundred dollar <laughs> credit the entry fee in 1920 they got their next director dr william a Brown. And by 1924, they had about 500,000 visitors coming wow. every year. So they figured now was a good time to expand a little bit. So they added another floor in 1924 that just about doubled the entire exhibit space in the museum. Then in November 1925, they opened a $9 million addition that turned it into five floors, making it about three times the original space with major expansions coming later in 1930, 1960, which included the Jean Delacour Auditorium. I swear, there's so many more things in the sky these yeah. days. But you know what? There isn't in the sky anymore because of Daggett. Birds. Thank you, Daggett. Thanks, Daggett, for trying to make this city a little quieter. <laughs> so then in 1976, uh, they also expanded, but their collection expanded to fill up all this extra space as well. Like they built and they came. If they expand it, the donations will come. Yeah, that was their motto. Not many people know that, that <laughs> Field of Dreams was based on the Natural History Museum. Between 1920 and 1940, they were slowly given a giant collection of photographs by Mode Winman of Western America. In 1930, to fill one of their new wings, a hunter named Leslie Simpson donated 32 animals he had killed and had mounted that became the Animals of Africa Hall that's still on display today. Oh, okay. So that came in 1930. I love that room. Oh yeah, that's a good one. It's, it's so dark and it's it almost has the feel of like an aquarium. Yeah. Being very cool and dark except nothing's alive, which is even better. There's a lot of rooms in there that I'm like, this is a mood. This yeah. is a very moody in here. Well, when we were looking at wedding venues, one of the places was the Natural History Museum and you could get married in the Animal Hall. Really? But we decided to go with live animals instead. <laughs> <laughs> but it was also so very I like the threat of having live animals around me. I like to turn the zoo into this hall <laughs> if I could. So for the 1932 Olympics, they had an art contest as part of the games where over 30 countries submitted over 1,100 pieces that they put on display inside the museum, which was happening across the lawn from them also at the yeah. Coliseum. In 1933, they exhibited Whistler's Mother by James McNeil Whistler, which was a big get for them in the art department. Mm -hmm. Back in 1930, they also published their first scientific work, which was a record of Pleistocene life in California. So they were starting to come into their own yeah. as a respected institution. And then the depression hit. <laughs> they were on the verge of having to close for really? a while to try to save money. But at the last minute, a donation from Mira Hershey, who owned the Hollywood Hotel and also was of the Hershey family. Really? Okay. Well, she saved them from that fate by giving a bunch of uh, money. And then they unwrapped it. And it was just chocolate. <laughs> I have all these gold coins. <laughs> and they're ready to donate. She sent all these briefcases. Oh, let's, let's open up and take a look at that cash. Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, but still. Still. What's the problem? Yeah, I don't see what the problem is. Get some graham crackers, get some marshmallows. Yeah, could we get a donation from the Graham family? <laughs> Alexander Graham Bell, maybe? And of course, this being a museum in Los Angeles, they had to have their section devoted to film history. Up until the 1960s, they had a motion picture hall filled with stuff like Charlie Chaplin's costume from Modern Times, the table Disney first drew Mickey Mouse on, Lon Chaney's makeup kit, Fred Astaire's tap shoes, and one of the miniature Kong models from King Kong. But he grew up now and he's fighting Godzilla. He's fighting Godzilla, and I don't know how I feel about it. You know, I want them both to win. I want them to have that Rocky <laughs> three moment where him and uh, Creed are running down the beach. I want that for Kong and what, Godzilla. Can't they just like punch each other at the same time yeah. and they both faint? Uh, yeah, and then like King Kong comes. starting to drown and Godzilla saves him, and, and then, then he wakes up just to see uh, Mothma come. Like, oh, we oh. got to team up for this one. Mothma has sort of a love affair going on with with Godzilla, though, so I think she would be a little bit jealous. That's probably what's fueling the whole thing. I think King Kong is the thing for Mothma. That's the subtext that no one's talking about <laughs> no one in this movie. So now they knew they were never going to be a major art museum in LA because the Huntington had that covered at the right. time. But then in the 40s, they got over 900 items worth of donations from both J. Paul Getty and William Randolph Hearst. Really? So suddenly they were a pretty big player in the art world. They brought on their first modern art curator, James Burns, who went and bought a Jackson Pollock for $400. $400 for a Jackson Pollock. God. But the board of trustees... This one has less splatter on it. No splatter, actually. No. <laughs> it's just a blank canvas. But it could be a Jackson Pollock someday. But the board of trustees trustees were so offended by the Jackson Pollock that they said it couldn't be displayed in public and could only be used for educational purposes. So he just hung it up in a part of the museum that they never went to and wow. they, they never found out about it. But imagine a Jackson Pollock being offensive. So we have Blue Boy here and then we have another 
famous art piece that I don't know because I only know Blue Boy. When we've talked about art in the past few days, Blue Boy keeps coming up. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what, I mean, I guess it's, I, don't, I have no idea what's offensive by it. It's, it doesn't have a, a mother praying to God holding a baby. I don't yeah. know. Surrounded by fruit. Can we get a bunch of these splatters to have like halos around it? <laughs> Turn them into little pooty? They also had an art restorer who worked there in the 40s named Gloria de Herrera who was friends with Man Ray. Oh my God. And would later become very well known for preserving Henri, uh, Henri, Henri Matisse's collages with a special glue recipe that she created oh wow, so that really? kind of became her legacy but she started out at the natural history museum which is cool then in the 50s norton simon joined the board but as we know he had a falling out and branched off to form his own museum which was something in the cards for the museum over the next couple decades the first big split happened in 1963 as we talked about in our art history museum yeah. when much like the artists that exhibited the art museum branched off from the rest and left to form its own museum the los angeles county museum of art so they lost their art collection. They couldn't rightfully call themselves the Museum of History, Science, and Art anymore. So this is when they officially renamed to be the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County because they lost all their art. That's a bummer. It, it is, but it's it's not like this person just, he quit and he took all of his art with him. Like it, it all belonged to the city. So it just went to a different, yeah. a different home of the city. <laughs> then the next big blow happened when the fossil exhibit became too big for its britches and decamped almost completely in 1977 and moved to the Page Museum, yeah. the new thing at the on the side of the the Brea Tar Pits. So now they lost their bones. Their bones. Yeah. And there's just a pile of skin and organs <laughs> now. These were both good moves for the city, but a setback to the Natural History yes. Museum. But obviously they bounced back from both and refocus more precisely on natural history and eventually were able to rebuild their dinosaur collection with a wider range of dinosaurs. Not yeah. just like, here's another saber toothed cat. Here's a bunch of dinosaurs we made up. Yeah. We put together a bunch of bones we found <laughs> and created <laughs> our own dinosaurs. We can come up with. They have these weird like Lego like attachments, <laughs> surprisingly. You know, many people know that about dinosaurs. So I made a Death Star. <laughs> There's not much to report after that until 2007 when some of the most major changes came to the building itself. That was the year they started a $135 million renovation that wouldn't end until 2013, which was the centennial of the museum. So 100 years later, the first order of business was a two-year retrofitting and restoration of the original rotunda that brought it back to its original glory, complete with a reworking of the stained glass, as I have to uh, specify with you. From George Jetson. And but the Jetson stained glass that he kept flying his spaceship through. <laughs> the renovation on it was done by the grandson of Jetson. Oh, really? Uh, 2010 saw the remodeling of the Age of Mammals exhibit. And in 2011, the new Dinosaur dinosaur, dinosaur, dinosaur. Hall opened, which is chock full of T-Rexes. Like oh. T-Rexes and like really cool dinosaurs now, yeah. just not just camels anymore. Yeah, top build dinosaurs. Yeah, A-listers. A-list. The George Clooney of dinosaurs. Yeah, who's a, who's a, come on, what's the difference? Am I right? I like William Hool. No. What's his name? Who? We talked about it in the Harry Potter intro. Hult. Oh, Nicholas Hult. Nicholas Hult. He's Hult. my new George Clooney. <laughs> I, I like real young actors. I like Nicholas Hult and uh, Timothy Chalamet and the little boy who opens toys on YouTube. Those are my <laughs> famous. Those are my favorite actors. So then in 2012 they opened up a brand new 3.5 acre outdoor nature garden that has an amphitheater and a trail you can walk along that shows the transition of local plants from the native days to today. It's wow. a really nice little garden. And this was the museum's first ever permanent outdoor exhibit. Then in 2013, they opened up a brand new entryway on the north side of the museum, closer to the Metro stop, the Otis Booth Pavilion, which is a six-story glass cube with a 63-foot-long whale skeleton hanging in it, complete with whale sounds and a light display that simulates being under the ocean. I like that room, too. I guess I just like rooms that make me feel like I'm at an aquarium. <laughs> so you like being underwater, but you hate the ocean. Look, I do. I would love to be on a submarine because I know I would be safe. I would, okay. I would love that experience experience but yeah i hate the idea of my exposed flesh my exposed being flesh. underwater or i hate the idea of my body touching water i hate it that's <laughs> why i hate it I, and melissa tells me you've got to take a shower <laughs> no i hate it i put have me to in stop. A, i can't keep tricking you into showering put me in a submarine and then no. maybe i'll take a shower <laughs> unless there's a giant squid or something that's yeah, the only yeah, yeah. the only downside uh, to all of my plans is the giant squid i, I don't want to live my jules verne nightmare <laughs> what a hollow earth <laughs> <laughs> what 80 days world Eight, trip <laughs> being stuck in an airport parade <laughs> In all, this six-year renovation redid 60% of the museum's public space and added 108,000 new square feet to fit in 12 new galleries and five exhibits. Two of these new exhibits opened that centennial year were a big deal for their mission of the museum in the city. There was the Interactive Nature Lab, which the outdoor garden was kind of part of that, but mm -hmm. this, is an in, this is an indoor garden, which teaches you all about local animals and plant life, complete with live specimens running around and a full exhibit of P22 in there also. It's a pretty cool... 
it's pretty interactive and they show you like all the types of like coyotes and yeah. wolves and things like that not wolves there's no wolves in Los Angeles you know something that's in Los Angeles uh, elephants and giraffes maybe I don't know I saw one in Griffith Park once. <laughs> it teaches you all about like what you can see along the river when right. you go on a walk and it's pretty interesting the second exhibit that was a big thing for it is the Becoming Los Angeles exhibit yeah. which focuses exclusively on the history of Los Angeles from beginning to end walking through that it's, the fu- end it's so funny walking through it now after doing the podcast for so long I'm like that's that episode that's that yeah. episode that's that episode yeah we really should be in that exhibit there should yeah. be we should maybe be docents for that n- no I want to be stuffed and put oh you want to be stuffed in one of the Egyptian sarcophagus you want your Charlie Chaplin Halloween costume and put on display there next to the real one yeah and more importantly <laughs> what's interesting about this is that the exhibit is the largest single exhibit in the entire museum the message that sends is that as opposed to other natural history museums that tend to give you just an encyclopedia of history of yeah. life on earth this museum has more of a local focus on natural history than most others do in wherever they are and yeah. that's kind of been the case since the beginning with like the history of early LA settlers when they first opened and things yeah. like that they have a big focus on climate change and how that affects us locally and a lot of all that is done in an interactive way that brings you into the process of the mindset of the museum rather than just show and tell and in doing so it makes it feel less stuffy and more alive than most other natural history museums that you'll go to but even still they've got everything you'd want from a natural history museum when you walk into the main entrance there's a giant t-rex fossil fighting yeah. a triceratops behind like the place where you buy tickets yeah there's a lady who's like reading like a dan brown novel to <laughs> kill time and behind her is the t- a t-rex, t-rex killing a triceratops <laughs> they found those in montana there's the extensive hall of birds exhibits on native american cultures there's the hall of gems and minerals which i also love because it feels like an aquarium <laughs> which has things like a 4644 carat topaz and a 65 pound quartz crystal ball which is one of the biggest in the world that's a great room too i love that place yeah I, so many fortunes i could tell on that <laughs> thing it's like the blockbuster exhibit because it's flashy you get to yeah. see jewels and stuff like that and sometimes i sneak in at night and take a few it looks like a room that stanley kubrick designed i don't know what i mean by that <laughs> but it, it's stylish there's a lot of tracking shots that's what i meant it's a <laughs> lot of tracking shots and shelly duvall's crying somewhere yeah you never know who's gonna pop out from behind the crystal ball <laughs> with an axe the original rotunda now has a rotating display of eight cases in it that they just put random things in from their collection like they have old hairballs from like animals and things like that so it's worth checking out every time you go because it's probably going to be different every time the original north wing is now the age of mammals the south wing is the dinosaur hall and the west wing is a tv show caught you there you weren't paying attention now were you <laughs> i was paying attention i'm waiting for you to talk about the bird room but is that the mammals room no the bird room is its own thing the, okay the, the birds is kind of on the other side and it's that's like, a movie too oh my god <laughs> i was paying attention oh uh-huh. no i wasn't paying attention <laughs> the west wing is a tv show um the birds is in theaters this, this summer <laughs> they have an off-site warehouse in vernon near the farmer john plant that they call the whale warehouse where they bring new marine animal specimens and melt away all their flesh and guts with chemicals that's the that's the uh, psycho that's room the james holmes <laughs> his hotels. legacy is still alive <laughs> but this time it's for whales <laughs> they also have resources online you can access through their digital digitized collection and also resources you yourself can come in and use if you're a student or doing official research through them like super powered microscopes and like surface scanners and things like that but they're also just a place for casual visitors with their first friday programs where you can go in there at night and there's music and things like that and they're also an official la tourism visitor center so you can get metro maps and guides in there also right. as you're standing underneath a triceratops but and th- you're in literally natural history museum is in like one of those spots of the city is like oh that's la history square you got you got USC right here. You yeah. got the Coliseum, Coliseum right here. You got the California Science Center right there, right which has there. a great right. night at the museum. <laughs> there's the California African American Museum. Mm-hmm. There's the Rose Garden. Yeah, and then they're building the George Lucas thing right there. Yeah, and then there's the where they play soccer with former sports arena, whatever that new stadium, the Bank of America, the Los stadium. Angeles former sports arena. It is becoming sort of like that's like our town square. Yeah, that's the place to go when you're visiting. It's one of and the you've many. You've got like two days to spend <laughs> in Los Angeles, but they're also still growing as a museum itself they still send people out on expeditions all over the world to find things like fossils in tibet and bugs in central america they can't get enough of them and geological studies in south america all this has grown them to over 35 million specimens covering 4.5 billion years of history making them the fourth biggest museum in the country the biggest natural museum in the western united states and also the second in collection size only to the smithsonian wow really yeah i think the smithsonian has like 40 million things in them 
them and they're spread out over a ton of museums yeah. and we have one building and HH Homes for Whales in Vernon and, and we are second to them but they still haven't stopped as part of their Natural History Museum Commons project there will be major changes coming to the building once again the 60 million dollar renovation will expand the west and south wings adding about 22,000 square feet and redoing another 53,000 it'll mean losing the Jean Delacour auditorium but that hasn't been used in years so instead they'll be putting in a new 400 seat theater a cafe on the roof more outdoor areas but the biggest change will be adding a whole new glass entry hall on the western side that's going to be three stories tall and it's going to have like an ever-changing cabinet of curiosities of exhibits that you can it's going to be free to enter that part so you can just go in and see what's there this time and they did this here because this is the entrance they anticipate most people using in the future with the metro stop right there right and also to try to put on a more competitive face to the george lucas museum which is literally right there it's a stone's throw away yeah and they're also going to redo the south entrance into more of a front porch hangout that connects more to the coliseum across the lawn that way but of course all these plans are now up in the air because they were approved right before covid kicked in as long as nothing happens so all of this money will be fine we know natural history and nothing crazy will happen (laughs) in the natural world when we approve this obviously they've been mostly closed since then so it's uh, a little iffy but this place is the heart of exposition park and i miss being able to go there but what i'll always miss most about it is that i missed my opportunity to become one of the people that go out digging for t-rexes for them and i chose to do this instead (laughs) yeah yeah that's you that is you isn't it i could have been in montana right now (laughs) every comedian's dream could have been in montana i could have been a touring paleontologist in montana 